when she talked to Ramanujan about doing mathematics, she would say he was always doing his sums. You are about to see an interview with Professor Bruce Burns, the world's leading expert on the work of the Indian mathematical genius Srinivasa Ramanujan. Professor Burnt is a distinguished professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He spent more than 20 years studying the three notebooks of Ramanujan, and as a result, he published five different volumes explaining the mathematics in them. When the so-called Wast Notebook of Ramanujan was found in 1976, Professor Burnt wrote another five volumes over it, together with the discoverer George Andrews. For this tremendous amount of work, Professor Burnt received the Expository Steel Prize from the American Mathematical Society. Stay with us till the end to hear some lesser known facts about Ramanujan, as well as Professor Burnt's opinion about the inspiration of Ramanujan, whether it came from the Indian goddess of creativity Namagiri or not. Uh, he was born in Erode. This is in the southern part of India, in the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it was in the home of his maternal grandmother. It was the custom then that the first child especially be born in the home of the maternal grandmother. And I think uh, in her case, uh, she had her other children also born in the home of her mother, that is Ramanujan's mother. Well, then she returned to Kumbakonam, where Ramanujan lived for little more than half of his life, in particular, it would be for up until he was about 17. So Kumbakonam is a relatively small town, again, in Tamil Nadu. It's famous for its temples. And at the age of 12, uh, he borrowed from an older student, Loney's Plane Trigonometry. So this has much more in it than the name suggests. It really has uh, introduction to calculus and infinite series. So this is the first book that we know of that he actually studied. And then at the age of 15, he borrowed from the local government college library, Carr's Synopsis of Pure and Applied Mathematics. This is a book that Carr used to tutor students to pass exams in London and Cambridge. And it's a very unusual book. It has between four and 5,000 results, just stated one after another with uh, only brief indications of proofs, uh, if any. So Ramanujan evidently learned a lot from Carr's book and probably set aside the, you know, a lot of these results to prove. So then he, he entered the government college of Kumbakonam at the age of 17. Uh, he had a scholarship, but he would only study mathematics. And so after the first year, he didn't pass uh, his exams except for mathematics. He lost his scholarship, and because the family was very poor, uh, he couldn't return. So he tried once again to, in, to get an education at Peshaya Pa College in Madras. So Madras, Madras, I think, is around... 180 miles north northeast of Kumbakonam. Uh, but the same thing happened. Uh, he um, couldn't pass the exams except for mathematics at the end of the year. So he married in 1909, and he was forced to get a job. He went to Madras in 1910, and he made he was able to get support from. R. Ramachandra Rao, who was a mathematician and a collector uh, in the civil service at uh, Madras. So he had evidently heard of uh, Ramanujan and uh, it was able to tell that this you know, fellow had talents. So he just gave him a stipend to work, uh, on which to, uh, so he could work. But it bothered Ramanujan that he was you know, getting money for, he thought, not doing work. So he ended the scholarship and got a job at the Madras Port Trust office. And manager there, or the chief accountant, uh, was S. Narayan Iyer, who was a, uh, probably one of the best mathematicians in India at that time. 
So he also could appreciate Ramanujan's mathematics. So he and Sir Francis Spring, who was the chair of the Madras Port Trust, encouraged Ramanujan to write English mathematicians about his work. So Ramanujan wrote to M. J. M. Hill, a professor at London, who did respond and obviously didn't quite understand everything that Ramanujan was trying to communicate. And then Ramanujan wrote two Cambridge mathematicians, Baker and Hobson, but their, they never replied and their names were not made public until just a couple of decades ago when Littlewood sort of by a slip of the tongue, you know, divulged their names. You know, they were embarrassed that they, uh, you know, were, didn't reply to Ramanujan's letters. And uh, then uh, the fourth person Ramanujan sent the, his mathematics to uh, was of course, G.H. Hardy. And in this letter that Ramanujan sent to Hardy were over 60 results uh, without proofs. So he and Littlewood that evening examined the letter and really a um, few things were wrong, but uh, um, some cases Ramanujan was a bit op optimistic about the error term and the prime number theorem, for example. And But there were many results which were new uh, as far as they could tell, and they didn't know how to prove them. So Hardy wrote to Ramanujan uh, encouraging him to come to Cambridge so that his uh, talents could be developed. He was re reluctant to do so because uh, his parents, in particular his mother, did not want him to uh, go. Uh, he was a Brahmin, and if a Brahmin crossed the seas, he would become sort of defiled. And you know, when he returned, he wouldn't be able to attend, uh, you know, a wedding or a funeral, for for example. So Ramanujan was uh, reluctant. To accept the invitation, he sent Hardy another letter with another 60 results in it. And Hardy again responded, encouraging him to uh, come to Cambridge. So his mother relented, and also Ramanujan and S. Narayan Iyer, again, he was the chief accountant at the Madras Port Trust, uh, they uh, took a pilgrimage to the temple of Na at Namakal. And there the family goddess Namagiri gave permission to Ramanujan to go to England. So in March of 1914, Ramanujan went to England, uh, stayed there five years, essentially corresponding to the five years of World War I. And uh, he became ill in the last two or three years and was confined to uh, nursing homes during that time. However, uh, he published some great papers, some of them with Hardy, and uh, became uh, well known, was elected to uh, the uh, Academy, Royal Academy in 1918, uh, Royal Society, I should say. He went home in 1919, but uh, unfortunately, the better climate and better food uh, did not help him, and he then passed away at, on April 26, 1920, at the age of 32. So that's a short summary of Ramanujan's life. Robert Canigal's book, The Man Who Knew Infinity, is the, is the real authority on Ramanujan's life. And Do you recommend the movie as well? Or, or yes, you... uh, I think the movie is, is very good. Yeah. I see, yeah. I was about to ask for this period between 1903 and 1910, it seems that he worked very hard during this period, actually from 1903 to 1913, before he went to England. Right. Yeah, so for a few years um, after he left to College of Kumbakom in 1904, yeah, he worked on mathematics on his own. Yeah. yeah, I just got curious when I read about this, how his parents were okay with him just not doing anything in this period up until 1910. Uh, yeah, they were not happy uh, with their son. That's great. Uh -huh. Once he uh, ran away from home, and in fact, 
they even his parents actually took out an advertisement or in the newspaper uh, asking people if they knew anything about his whereabouts. So, wow. How long he was away? I don't, I honestly don't remember. It was months, however. It was less than a year, but more than a month. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, my next question is about the wife of Ramanujan. So you you knew her personally, as far as I know, and when did you meet her and what were your impressions? I can't say I, I knew her. I, I uh, met her twice. Uh, the first time in 1967, and then the next time, I think, five years later. So... So I talked with her um, through her adopted son, uh, uh, W. Narayanan. She raised two children. Uh, the parents who lived in uh, the same area where she lived both died. And so she just took the two children and uh, raised them herself. And uh, one of them, Narayanan, who was the closest to his adopted mother, uh, was with her on both of the occasions. He did the translations uh, for her. Yeah, it was really a great uh, privilege to talk with her. She, whenever we talked about Ramanujan, which is most of the, you know, time, uh, she gets very excited talking about him. So we talked a bit about the last year of his life, and uh, she would had this what she called a fomentation vessel which she used to draw take water from and try to you know lessen his fever so that was in, in the family uh, she had that family or that vessel uh, in her home she also had the a sculpture that paul granlin had made of uh, her husband former husband that was uh, in her home and she and um, a garland uh, around it. When she talked of uh, Ramanujan uh, about doing mathematics, she would say he was always doing his sums. That's, <laughs> so she told me he, he was doing his sums uh, up until four days before he died, uh, when the pain became uh, too great. Uh, no. I see, so she, she had another husband? That no, okay. because... Uh, Remarriage is uh, not possible in India, uh, or at least at that time. Uh, so it was impossible for her to uh, remarry. So I think she was just uh, 20 when he died. And, uh, I see, yeah. And they, of course, didn't have children. With... Right. Yeah. She was, I think, 95 when she died. Oh, that's quite old. Also, they got married very early, right? She was nine. She was nine, that's correct. So they married in 1909, you know, when she was just nine years old. And then uh, in 1910, Ramanujan brought her to Madras to live with him and also brought his mother to live with him as well. Can you say a few words about how you got interested in this topic, his life and, and work. The first time I heard of Ramanujan was uh, in a course on analytic number theory and or modular forms with applications to analytic number theory that I took as a fourth year graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. This was taught by Marvin Knopp. And uh, he, in this class, uh, did prove Ramanujan's congruences for the partition function and discussed uh, the famous Hardy-Ramanujan Hardy asymptotic formula for P of N. So this is the first time I, I heard of Ramanujan. And then after I got my PhD, I went to the University of Glasgow in Scotland for one year. And there my mentor was Robert Rankin. Um, Rankin was Hardy's last PhD student and had long been interested in Ramanujan and his work. So I remember one day talking with him in his office about Ramanujan, and he told me about his notebooks, and he said to me, I'll be glad to loan these notebooks to you if you're interested, 
However, I told him that I wasn't interested. So a huge mistake on my part. Uh, fortunately, I rectified it later, you might say. So I um, then came to the University of Illinois as an assistant professor. And the head of the department who hired me was actually the advisor of Marvin Knopp, who taught the course at the University of Wisconsin, where I learned about Ramanujan. So he is a re relatively well-known analytic number there, so quite famous. And um, you know, being famous and the head of the department, uh, you know, he often then assigned the tasks that he would get to others. So I can't remember, was it, I think probably either second or third year there, uh, he had been asked to referee two papers of Emil Grosswald, uh, who uh, in these papers proved some formulas from Ramanujan's notebooks. So I refereed these papers for him. And I didn't think too much about it uh, for a few years. Uh, but then uh, I took my first sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Study. And in February of 1974, uh, at the Institute, I was working on some transformation formulas for Eisenstein series. And I suddenly realized that I could prove these formulas from the notebooks that Grosswald had proved. And uh, so this is really a marvelous uh, event for me. And the Institute did not have a copy of the notebooks, but Princeton University Library did. So I checked them out, found a couple more formulas I could prove, but a few thousand others that I couldn't prove. So uh, I just sort of used my ideas as much as possible in the next couple of years, but I didn't really look thoroughly at the notebooks. And then it was the end of the spring semester in 1976. And I, I said to myself, let's try to prove everything in chapter 14 of the second notebook. Uh, this is the chapter where the formulas that Grosswald had proved are found. So I had a head start. Uh, and all together, there are 87 results in this chapter. I worked on this for over a year and uh, completed it uh, with the help of a couple of my graduate students, in particular, Ron Evans, then uh, George Andrews visited, and he told me that when he discovered the lost notebook, that uh, he had found that the notes that G.N. Watson and B.M. Wilson uh, accumulated in their attempt to edit the notebooks in the late 1920s and uh, early 1930s had been preserved at Trinity College, Cambridge. So I thought, well, if I had a copy of their notes, maybe I could uh, edit further chapters. So by edit, by the me, by I mean that you know, prove the results, uh, or if they are known, you know, then I just cite a place where they, they can be found, proofs can be found. So uh, I then went back to the beginning of the second notebook. There are three notebooks all together, and the second is the uh, most um, useful in the because it is a revised enlarged edition of the first and the third is relatively short. So I went back then to the beginning uh, and then gradually worked my way uh, through the notebooks. Uh, it took a little over 20 years and uh, I had a lot of help from others, in particular graduate students. So I published five volumes uh, on the notebooks and uh, so, you know, the last one, I think, was in 1999. So then, you know, I had mentioned that George Andrews found the lost notebook in the spring of 1976 at Trinity College Library at Cambridge. And there are lots of things in the lost notebook that I was interested in. And uh, so I suggested to George, well, maybe we can you know, work on the lost notebook uh, like I worked on the other notebooks, the earlier notebooks. And, he says, yeah, do you think we can get it in uh, one volume or will it take two volumes? Well, after 20 years, uh, it took five volumes. So that's a summary of my work on the notebooks. So. I see, I see. And for you, what do you think is the reason that no one before you kind of worked that thoroughly on the first three notebooks? Um, yeah, it's hard to say. 
So, you know, so, you know, for, they weren't available until 1957 and um, they weren't um, really well known. Somehow Grosswald found out about them and, uh, you know, looked at them and found a few theorems, you know, to prove. So I owe a lot to Emo Grosswald. Yeah, probably that was a major reason, hmm. right? If um, if those are anyone who is interested in results uh, or questions that Ramanujan asked that are easy to understand, I highly recommend going to the problems he submitted to the Journal of the Indian Mathematical Society. So he began submitting these problems in uh, 1911. Uh, before he went to England. So there are 58 of these problems, and uh, along with two of my former students, Suni Kang and Yun Sa Che, uh, we uh, wrote uh, an article about all of them. So indicating the uh, work that had been done on them uh, and uh, since uh, Ramanujan posed the problems. So a number of them are very easy to understand. For example, I think one is uh, n factorial plus one uh, is a perfect square for n equals four, five, seven. So are there any other values for which n factorial plus one is a perfect square? We don't know. So it's an unsolved problem. No. There are a couple problems uh, with, uh, that um, are unsolved having to do with approximations and the number of people have worked on these problems. They um, actually involve the exponential function. So these two problems are in Ramanujan's notebooks as well as you know in the uh, Journal of the Indian Mathematical Society. I should say that Ramanujan was very, very good at finding approximations and both numerically and in terms of functions. Uh, in fact, you know, many times I would just, I've been absolutely astounded how he could make such approximations, you know, without any use of computer algebra, for example. You know, he didn't have mathematica. Right? And he had many asymptotic expansions. So he would never use the word asymptotic. He would just write out, say, the first few terms and then say nearly or very nearly after them. Oh, yes. So the famous uh, taxi cab number 1729 with its two representations are part of a problem that Ramanujan submitted to the Journal of the Indian Mathematical Society. So in particular, he asked for solutions of Euler's uh, equation, uh, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed uh, equals one. So, and then he gave a family of solutions. And he, so, and he then listed seven of them, I think there's six or seven, and one of them was the, the famous uh, 1729 representations. I see, but for, uh, speaking about this list of 58 problems, that some of these were just, just open problems, right? They were not actual results. So most of them uh, had solutions. So a number of them had to do with series identities and evaluations, and were more or less in the spirit of mathematics that was being done in India at that time. Mm -hmm. But a number of others were far away from anything being done in India at that time. And some of these, as I indicated, are open problems. And um, in terms of elementary problems, there are some beautiful algebraic identities that he submitted as problems. And a couple of them are, I, I found just uh, astounding because, uh, you know, no one would ever think of these identities. And, you know, after we see them, we can prove them. But, you know, I don't know how he ever found these, you know. I mean, they're not easy identities. Right, and uh, the next question is, Yeah, it, it, it depends on uh, what I'm thinking of at the time. So one of my favorite things was Ramanujan's cubic theory of theta functions. 
So Ramanujan, if there's any topic that Ramanujan spent the most time on would be theta functions. And, but those have lots of ramifications in terms of class invariance, modular equations, Eisenstein series, and, and things of this. So these things all arose out of Ramanujan's in, interest in theta functions. But then he had in his notebooks uh, what I call a cubic theory. And so these are different kinds of theta functions, you might say. They, you know, they're not part of the classical theory. And, you know, I wonder well, how he ever came up with this. How did he ever, you know, think that any kind of this kind of other theory, you know, would, you know, could be developed or anything. So I, I, I was amazed then, and I'm still amazed that he could ever think of this, you know, that there might be something like what is called a cubic theory, what I call the cubic theory. And then he also had beginnings of a quartic theory and a sextic theory. But the quartic theory is more easily derived from the classical theory, the square, so to speak. And then the sextic theory is sort of an, an amalgamation, you might say, of the cubic and the classical theory. So not quite as interesting as the cubic theory by itself. And then now there's a conference by Zoom next early next week, uh, organized by Eric Mortensen. This conference was supposed to be live in St. Petersburg after the ICM meeting, but it was canceled, of course, just like the ICM meeting. But it's going to be Zoom next week. And anyway, one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, is a transformation for Eisenstein series where the powers of n are not integers. So in Eisenstein series are positive integers. I mean, and so Ramanujan had this beautiful transformation formula uh, where you know for Eisenstein series without integers, it's just a marvelous formula. So it's from the notebooks, and I had proved it you know, 20, 25 years or so ago, can't remember, well, more than 20 years ago. And uh, so in the topic that I was going to, I'm going to discuss for uh, in this Zoom meeting, it's relevant for what I was saying. So I, I went back and and uh, re-examined this. But so that's now high on my list, you might say, is, is an interesting thing, but yeah. A lot of results in Q series in general, which are just uh, remarkable. And, uh, right, yeah, he, he had very high esteem for series, yeah, as we know. Okay, and is there a result, not a result, but a claim, I would say, uh, of Ramanujan that many people are currently trying to prove, but unsuccessfully? Not there's not one that dominates. As I mentioned, there are you know a few of these in the problems he submitted to the Journal of the Indian Mass Society, and most of which are in the notebooks. There was a problem re uh, that was solved recently. It's not really known at uh, hardly at all, but it's in Ramanujan's lost notebook. When I examined this problem, uh, well, the problem is incomplete. So Ramanujan has an identity uh, evaluating a quotient of theta functions, seventh order theta functions, and he indicates three quantities, but do he doesn't indicate what they are. So in other words, he just leaves them blank. And so I I had no idea, you know, what was in the, is supposed to be. Uh, there were some other results along with this, which were actually first proved by my former student, Seung Wan Sun. And I knew they were related, but I didn't know how to fill in the three missing functions at all. Um, well, there's a Hungarian fellow, named, I'm not sure I pronounce it, Reebok, it's R-E-B-A and um, accent mark K, maybe you know better than I do. Oh, how it pronounces it. Anyway, he was working as a technician. He, he um, did not have a doctorate in mathematics. And he became interested, and I corresponded with him. 
and uh, it's he was able to fill in the, the missing items and it was very difficult to do so he first had a thought he had a proof and there's an order for these three so he had a proof but without the order he uh, discovered a mistake at the last moment and uh, then in the last few months he was able to correct the work and i think he's now submitted his work to the ramanujan journal but it's an excellent piece of work it was really a hard you know, very hard to fill in these missing pieces and uh, it's just a you know he did a super job and uh, he's now studying for a phd in tromsø norway oh i see how did you get in touch with him in the first place he wrote to you or yes it turns out that i had met him once in austria oh. uh in linz and he came from hungary to uh, hear my talk and after the talk he asked if he could uh, have a picture taken of uh, himself and me you know i didn't know him at, at the time and i had completely forgotten about it but then he started writing me about this problem and uh he eventually told me yeah, I, that he uh he had met me and he showed me the picture that he had of us but uh, so he just wrote me out of the you know out of the blue he said i he was interested in this problem and he had some ideas and and so we have a, we exchanged dozens of letters about this problem yeah i'm not hungarian so i not good in pronunciation <laughs> but uh, yeah anyways uh so this is an example of one claim of Ram uh, ramanujan that it's finally resolved so to speak and maybe there are some other problems that people try to establish or other claims well i think uh in the notebooks uh i thought i had covered everything uh in the five volumes it turns out that you recently found that there were two i didn't cover ramanujan loved modular equations and he crossed out two of them he just, you know so i didn't bother with them, he crossed them out. So I figured, you know, they were wrong. But then recently, uh, a couple of Indians, uh, they looked at these and they're actually correct. So <laughs> it's a, anyway, so they recently published a paper on them. It was a bit embarrassing for me because, you know, I just sort of ignored them. And... Probably he just wrote these two down and he said, okay, it's not good enough to be in this textbook. <laughs> Yeah, I, it could be. I don't know. Yeah. But um, so I should say that when Ramanujan's lost notebook was published in 1988, so it was 12 years after Andrews discovered it. Then there were a number of other partial manuscripts, fragments, and things that were published with uh, the lost notebook. So uh, the title of the volume is the lost notebook and other unpublished papers so most of these were found um, in the uh, papers of gn watson after he died and this is where the lost notebook was also found in his papers so when andrews and i you know then completed our our work uh, with the last volume published in 2018 uh, there was actually one result uh, which I had worked on uh, with my colleague Alexander Zarescu and my former student son Kim for several years. We, it was an identity, um, a double series identity connected with Gauss's famous circle problem. And we had proved the uh, identity with the order of summation reversed from what Ramanujan had. And the methods we use we could not use um, the way to prove the identity the way ramanujan stated it so uh, that remained open but then uh, finally uh Zarescu and uh, his student junxian li and i proved the result of for the way ramanujan stated it but it was after the publication of the fifth volume of Andrews and myself. 
that was the last result. But, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if someone finds something and say, you forgot this or something. So I see. And you, since you mentioned the Wasp Notebook, why did it take 12 years to be published? Yeah, that's a good question that I don't know. I don't know why it took so long for to publish it. Yeah, especially since, you know, Andrews uh, and his uh, colleagues and students were, you know, producing lots of papers uh, generated from the Lost Notebook. You know, Andrews had his copy, which, you know, was circulated amongst lots of people. <laughs> oh, so you're saying some people were publishing stuff about claims in the Wasp Notebook before it was published? Oh, lots of people, lots yeah. Of, okay. Yeah, yeah, lots of papers were published, yeah. Oh. So, many by George Andrews, yeah. Okay, yeah. They, I guess they first uh, tried to investigate themselves what, what is there, maybe. Yeah, so I mean, it was published by the Tata Institute, and yeah, I really don't, know why it took them so long i mean they could have published it you know, i'll have to ask george about that i mean there was no reason why they couldn't have published it in you know 1977 or 1978 you know? right you know? so we think this is what happened so in, in 1923 the registrar at the university of madras francis dewsbury sent to Hardy a packet of Ramanujan's papers. And we are almost certain that this packet contained the lost notebook. And, but there, uh, Dewsbury, neither Dewsbury or Hardy made any list of what was actually in this shipment of papers. So Hardy evidently uh, had it, uh, in his possession until he sent it, gave it to Watson, probably in the mid or late 1930s. We, we don't know for sure. So Watson was president of the London Mathematical Society. And in his presidential address, I can't remember, was 1927 or 29, I'm not sure. Uh, he wrote a paper on the final problem, uh, namely, uh, results in the last letter that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy, uh, which were uh, in the lost notebook, or just a small portion of the results in the lost notebook. And anyway, in this uh, lecture, which was later published in the Proceedings of the London Math Society, he said, I discovered these two mock theta functions, I think of the third order, and it's surprising that Ramanujan didn't discover them. Well, if he had looked at the lost notebook, he would have seen that Ramanujan did discover them. So either Watson was not careful and didn't notice they were in the lost notebook if he had it, or he just hadn't gotten it from uh, Hardy yet. We really don't know. But the title of his talk was, again, The Final Problem. So the last of the Sherlock Holmes story was the adventures of the final problem. So Watson, the court, was the uh, the hero, so to speak, or the main character in the Sherlock Holmes stories. So, uh, so there are two reasons then for the title, that Watson and then the final problem, you know, the final problem being, you know, what's in the last letter to, to Hardy. Uh, Watson was the professor of mathematics at the University of Birmingham for most of his, well, it really his entire career after he left uh, Cambridge. So he died in 1965. And uh, one of the people that visited his widow was Robert Rankin. Uh, so Rankin had actually succeeded Watson as the professor of mathematics at the University of Birmingham. Uh, after Watson retired, but uh, Rankin was a Scotsman. And so when the professorship at Glasgow opened up, he took that professorship. So he um, visited Mrs. Watson then in 1965 after uh, her husband died and they discussed, you know, what should we do with all these papers that uh, Watson left behind on the, uh, his attic floor office? 
So over a period of three years, Rankin would take, you know, train trips to Birmingham from Glasgow to sort through these papers. And uh, so he found uh, what has now been called the Lost Notebook and other papers. Uh, in particular, Watson copied some manuscripts of Vermontingen, partial manuscripts. And these partial manuscripts are not, no, he threw them away. So we don't have them in, uh, except for Watson's copies. So anyway, Rankin sent all of this Ramanujan material that he found uh, on Watson's attic floor office uh, to Trinity College, Cambridge in December of 1968. So Mrs. Watson uh, had said her husband was always very fond of Trinity College. So he and uh, Rankin and Mrs. Watson said that uh, those papers that are worth preserving Rankin would send to Trinity College. So there they were for about seven and a half years before Andrews then uh, rediscovered them. So there really wasn't a lot, uh, a notebook. It was just a sheaf of 158 pages. Uh, and the pages uh, were in various kinds of paper uh, that Ramanujan could find. And it really wasn't lost because Rankin and the librarians at least knew about this. So Rankin was upset that uh, Andrews called this Ramanujan's lost notebook. However, if I were Andrews, I would have done exactly the same thing. But then why did Rankin didn't tell, you know, the mathematical community about that? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he didn't my guess is he didn't realize the importance of this work i never asked him that question but then from what you said it seems that it's possible that we have had several other papers of ramanujan uh, that were given to watson or accessible to watson but they didn't get to trinity college library that, that's correct so there are seven or eight manuscripts or partial manuscripts that uh, Watson had written down and copied. So one of them is a very famous manuscript on the partition and tau functions. Yeah, if that had been lost, it would have been a huge loss to mathematics. So, you know, it's, you know, you know maybe, you know, there are other manuscripts that have of Ramanujan that could have been lost by Watson. Uh, uh, his attic floor office was evidently just a huge mess of papers. And uh, as Whitaker's son, so Watson wrote this very famous treatise, uh, A Course in Modern Analysis with J.M. Whitaker. And Whitaker's son also visited uh, Mrs. Watson after her husband's death. And he said you could just make lucky dips into the mass of papers and you might find uh, a railroad schedule or an income tax return from 1920, uh, you know, or you might get some mathematics when you dipped into all these papers. You know, it could be that, you know, very well that some papers of Ramanujan were lost. Yeah, and maybe from what you just said, that the worst so-called notebook was actually a bunch of unrelated papers and results. Maybe this suggests that probably there are some other papers that, you know. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've uh, worried about that for many years. Right? <laughs> it's been a concern. <laughs> yeah, nothing I could do about it, of course. But yeah, I, Watson, you know, just was not careful about you know, these precious manuscripts of you know, that he held over Ramanujan. So. Right. In addition, I listened to one of your recent talks about the topic, and at the end, you mentioned two other things about lost letters. But you didn't have time to, to tell more about uh, these two things. So let me ask you. So the first was that we know of at least two lost pages from Ramanujan's first letter to Cardi. Is this true and how do we know? 
Yes, because the numbering stops and continues. You know, from the numbering, it appears that, you know, there's a gap. And uh, I think Hardy himself acknowledged that there are a couple pages missing. And I think, you know, there were one or two results that were mentioned later as being in the first letter, but they're, they're not found in the first letter as we have it. I think, you know, Hardy said that it could have easily been lost in the so he, he acknowledged a couple of pages had been lost from the first letter. I see. And what about the last letter? You said that uh, part of it was also missing. Yeah, at least one page is missing because Ramanujan did say something about his health, but not that he was really sick. I think Hardy, you know, said, I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know he mentioned his health or something like that but not that he was ill but in the last letter that we have there was no mention of ramanujan's how he was feeling so there must have been a page you know where you know he said i'm fine or whatever it was you know to hardy that page uh you know is missing Quite interesting. And a few words about the memory of Ramanujan, according to some writings, he had phenomenal memory, being able to memorize several digits of pi square root of two other numbers. There isn't really any evidence that he was a, had a super memory. I mean, he, his memory was certainly much greater than the average. For example, you know, he recorded his results in notebooks without proofs. And I'm quite certain that if anyone asked him, you know, how do you prove this result? He, he could, you know, find it, you know, reconstruct his proof. So I think that's, you know, perhaps the main reason or one of the main reasons why he didn't put his proofs in the notebooks because he could reproduce them. But I don't think it's, you know, he was super exceptional. I uh, don't know anything about his memorization of digits of pi. I had a former postdoc, uh, Nayandeep Barua, who um, has memorized the first 5,000 digits of pi. But, you know, Ramanujan, you know, maybe had, you know, I'm just guessing, memorized the first 20 or 30 or 40 digits of pi. Uh, I, I don't think it was uh, anything high on his list of things to do. Right. And maybe two other reasons for Ramanujan just not writing proofs could be that the paper was expensive. This is. Yes, yeah. And also, do you think he was influenced by the Book of Kar? Yeah, I think all three of these uh, reasons are good. The influence of Kar, paper was very expensive. And I think he could recall, you know, the proofs of the results he was recording uh, in the notebooks. Right. Okay. Yeah. My next question is about some lesser known facts about Ramanujan, since our channel is called The Lesser Known Math. So if you can just point out two or three interesting facts that are <laughs> not that well known, what they will be. Oh, yes. That's sort of hard because Canigal in his biography is very thorough. So on a personal level, I really can't say much. One thing is that Ramanujan didn't learn how to talk until he was four. So that that's not very well known. He was also a very heavy boy. Uh, he didn't get much exercise. I guess he was doing mathematics all the time. And, uh, one of his school friends uh, reported that Ramanuja said to him, you better not uh, have any disagreements with me or, because I will sit on you and crush you. He said. <laughs> anyway, so when uh, Ramanuja went to England, uh, just as he was departing, he exchanged slates with S. Narayana Iyer the um, chief accountant at the Madras Port Trust. And, you know, 
it's clear that these two were very close friends. And Ramanujan had a lot of respect for him. He was the one that hired Ramanujan. And um, they, it's reported that the two of them, after work, would uh, work on mathematics into the wee hours of the morning. So they exchanged slates as a matter of respect for each other. So the family of Esnarayana Iyer then has uh, the slate of Ramanujan. So it's passed on from generation to, to generation. And my favorite picture of myself uh, is the picture I have holding the slate. So my wife does not like me to say that this is my favorite picture of myself. She feels our wedding picture is, is the, the best picture of myself. But anyway, um, so we'll, we'll call it even, I guess. And, uh, let, let it be even, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and uh, I also noticed that in your article from 1987, dedicated to the 100 years of the birth of Ramanujan, you make an interesting comparison with Bach. So I, yeah, Bach was really not that highly thought of in his time. In fact, I think one of his sons was um, more highly thought of than you know his father. And so uh, it wasn't until later, after he died, that you know he was he got the respect that he did. In fact, I think the Brandenburg and Charity were found over a hundred years after he died, as, as I recall. So, you know, you might say the Brandenburg uh, Concerti, I think there are six of them, it might correspond to Ramanujan's notebooks or lost notebook in some sense. So Ramanujan indeed was famous when he died, but I think his fame sort of was at a plateau until the notebooks and lost notebook were you know, brought you know to the public. So in that sense, I thought he compared with Bach. Okay. One of our last questions, a few words about the conference in 1987 on the 100th years. It was in Illinois, I guess Urbana. Yeah, we got together a lot of people you know, who had been working on Ramanujan. So probably the most famous lecture uh, was the opening lecture of Freeman Dyson. I highly recommend that lecture. You know, it's a non-technical lecture, but uh, just, you know, telling about how Ramanujan influenced his life. So it's the beginning lecture of our book called Ramanujan Revisited, you know, giving the papers arising from the conference. And then also uh, S. Chandrasekhar, the famous Nobel Prize winning physicist gave a banquet address and uh, he told about the influence of uh, Ramanujan's in his life. I mean, it's indirect, but he recalls that his mother telling him that when he was a boy, she said a famous mathematician died. And so Chandrasekhar you know, sort of got the feeling that, you know, if someone like this, come from a poor background, could become famous, he and other Indians, you know, born in some, in humble circumstances, might also uh, achieve fame. So I, I was a very inspiring lecture, I thought. And the first part of the lecture was controversial because he talked about Ramanujan's religious views. And he agrees with Hardy that Ramanujan was not very religious and that he said he, Ramanujan believed that, you know, essentially all religions are valid and that it was a matter of custom rather than belief uh, for Ramanujan to make all these observances. So, you know, most Indians do not agree with Chandrasekhar about that. I, I think the comments are very interesting. Uh, I, I tend not to agree with Chandra Sagar, but you know, we don't know exactly <laughs> what Ramanujan's beliefs are. So I, it's right. not, not, it's not a big deal for me. <laughs> but you, why do you think 
it was more than a custom uh well so we have this yeah uh story and i have i have no reason to uh discount it that you know he did go to the temple of goddess namagiri for three days and three nights to get you know, permission from goddess namagiri to go to england and his family evidently was very observant uh, so i i think he respected uh you know the the religious culture in which he, you know he was raised at least all the evidence i think or most there's evidence in that direction i see yeah i even uh, heard some speculations that some people believe the inspiration he had was because of his faith and something like a direct messages from from this goddess yeah i think well uh, in fact uh, he probably said that in fact i think it's reported he did you know so if someone who is not in mathematics ask him how did you get this you know result or how did you prove your theorems he can't really explain to them oh you know here is an infinite series and i manipulated it or something he would say the goddess namagiri he gave me this formula in my dreams. You know, this is the best answer he could give to someone asking about how do you get these results. Uh, he actually gave this as an answer uh, to someone. Yeah, I, yes, I, uh, it's reported. I can't give you the exact citation, but I, I have read that. Yeah, get this team for interesting non-trivial results. So whether this is from from the goddess. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it was indeed a mixture, like he believed so, but it was mostly because of his personality. Yeah, I mean, when he does mathematics, he's not thinking of goddess Namagiri, just like all of us being religious or not, we, we don't you know, think of God as we're doing this, but you know, we might say, we might thank God, you know, for, the inspiration or you know the ability to do something like this so i mean that's how i feel that ramanujan felt that he, he was thankful uh what he had been given so i you know i i think relig you know he he was religious in that sense right okay okay that were all my questions thanks okay. a lot i really appreciate you agreed